Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me again this afternoon to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic here in Erie County. Today, we have three new positive cases of COVID-19 in Erie County to report. One of those cases is in their 30s, one in their 50s, and unfortunately, we have another child under the age of five. This has us at a total of 87 cumulative positives and 1,850 negative tests. Erie County Department of Health, as always, continues its contact tracing and to communicate with the state about the cases that we have. These three new cases all reside in zone one, which can be found on the cumulative cases map by zone at eriecountypa.gov. We still have 56 recovered cases to date out of the 87 total cases. Of our 87 cases, 47% are male and 53% are female, which still keeps us pretty close to 50-50. And the age breakdown is as such, 3% ages four or younger, 1% ages five to nine, 5% ages 10 to 18, 15% ages 19 to 24, 32% ages 25 to 49, 26% ages 50 to 64, and 16% are 65 or older. As I was adding up those numbers, it's um, interesting to see that we have well over 50% of our cases being individuals who are younger than 50 years old. Regarding race, we have 63% Caucasian, 22% African American, 13% unknown, and less than 1% Asian. Again, we ask everyone to use the best practice, which is to consider that every person you come in contact with may have COVID-19 and you also may have COVID-19. So do what you can to protect others and to protect yourself. Crawford County has 19 cases, McKean has six, and Warren County has one. Chautauqua County has 32 cases and three deaths, and Ashtabula County has 113 cases and 11 deaths. The Pennsylvania Alliance for Golf has issued guidance for a safe reopening of golf which you can find under our business resources on eriecountypa.gov. Because as of uh, Friday, this week, May 1st, golf courses are allowed to open again in Pennsylvania with some restrictions. So this guidance provides information for staffing, some common use items and equipment, for tea times, and for use of the clubhouse and pro shop. Under resources on the COVID-19 page of eriecountypa.gov, under business guidance, you can find this information. As we start to reopen Erie County, please continue to take those precautions that we have asked you to when you leave your home. And mostly, remember to stay in place, maintain your space, and cover your face. Wear a mask, proper, uh, use proper hand washing, and maintain that six foot physical distancing. Remember that your mask protects me and my mask protects you. We continue to ask all of you to be our partners in this effort and to share this information with others that you know. Thank you, thank you for doing your part in helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19 here in Erie County. And finally, I'd like to remind everyone to complete the 2020 census. The census response numbers for this week are 59% from Erie County and 52% within the city, which of course is part of the county, but we want to give those numbers for the city of Erie also. So 52% of city residents have responded, 59% countywide. And it's important to remember that half of the money that comes back to the county because of the census numbers comes back in for medical and health programs. And particularly in this time of COVID-19, it's important for all of us to know how important you being counted is for that funding coming here. Much of the money that's coming back from the federal government and the state government to fight COVID-19 is based on census counts. So you are important. You need to be counted 
Every person in your home needs to be counted. So if you have not completed the census yet, I please ask you to go to the census2020.gov and uh, complete that form on there, or you can make a phone call, and those numbers are on their website also. Everyone should have received something in the mail, and I ask you to please complete the census as soon as you can. And now I'd like to open it up to the media for questions, and we'll start today with JET TV. Hi, Kathy. It's Samir with JET. Uh, really quick, do you know out of these uh, three cases where uh, the individual is under five years old, do they all live at the same residence? Are they related? Do you have any of in that information? Uh, they do not all live at the same residence, but I can tell you, obviously, that they're all uh, connected to other positives, which obviously makes sense. Um, and uh, they are a very vulnerable population, just as our elderly are uh, right now. As far as I know, they all are at home recovering, and um, we hope that they have a full recovery. But you know, this goes to show just that um, when someone is found positive, we ask them to be isolated, isolated from everyone in their family, their children, their spouse, uh, whoever it is that they live in that household with, to be in a separate room, to have a separate bathroom, uh, to eat their meals completely separately, and we need them to do that until they are 72 hours free of any symptoms because everyone who lives in their house is in danger of contracting the COVID-19 virus from them. And uh, just to follow up to that really quick, this might be a little out of your scope, but um, obviously the implementation of face masks, do we know if these younger children are wearing the face mask? And sometimes it might be a little bit harder to get uh, a younger person to wear one. So do you know that or is that kind of out of? I don't know if they right are now. wearing one, of course. And I know, um, you know, if they're a baby, uh, if they're very small, it's almost impossible, of course, to have them wear a face mask. Remember, if the young child has COVID-19, when they wear a face mask, it protects you, um, the person who's around them. You wearing a face mask, mask protects the children. And I think that's something maybe not everyone really understands still. Um, my wearing a face mask doesn't protect me. It doesn't keep me from contracting COVID-19. But if I have it and I don't know it, my wearing a mask would protect a child or, or any person that I would be around. So that's why the wearing of the mask is so important. So if you have a family member who has COVID-19 and they are now in isolation in your home, in a room by themselves, completely separated from the rest of the family, I think it would probably be wise for everyone in the family who's in that house, especially if you have really, really young children, to wear a mask probably most of the time, wash your hands very, very frequently, and try to c contain the spread within the house. But that's, um, you know, it kind of gets out of my scope of uh, not being a healthcare practitioner, but um, it just seems wise to me when you know that wearing a mask protects those other people who are around you. And if you've been in close contact with somebody, you know, say it's your spouse uh, who has been diagnosed, um, if you wear a mask and you have children in the house, you might reduce the risk somewhat of uh, those children contracting it. But again, it's not a guarantee because you've all been living in the house together. But a little baby or a very small child, it's going to be very difficult to get them to be able to keep a mask on. So if you can make it fun, you know, uh, a little bit older child maybe, and not a baby, but, um, you know, bandana and, you know, uh, or something that's fun for them and, and they're more willing to wear it, but it's going to be difficult. Your Times News. Hi, Kathy. This is Maddie. Um, I wondered if you know or if you have any theories as to why we are seeing so many cases among younger people, people under 50, like you mentioned. So what we're finding is many, many of our cases are connected. And they're connected through families. They're connected through groups of people who've gotten together, people who've not kept themselves socially distanced from people they don't live with. And that is why we continue to see the spread. Um, much of our spread continues to be people who know someone else who's positive, but maybe when they were together, they didn't know that they had COVID-19. And so that's what we are seeing in Erie County a lot of. And uh, I think that's why, obviously, we're seeing these, these numbers so high within certain segments of populations. Thank you. Uh -huh. Erie News Now. Good afternoon. A question for you regarding the state and businesses. Any further communication with them? I realize we're not going to get a definitive answer until later this week as to whether or not even the county can reopen, much less 
what sorts of businesses or what that would look like. But has there been any sort of communication leading up to then, or is it still pretty much radio silence out of Harrisburg? I uh, have a phone call uh, shortly after this press briefing today with the state, have another one tomorrow with the state. And so uh, we are hopefully hoping to get more information from them. My understanding is the state is running numbers uh, probably as we speak on all of the counties that they are looking at potentially opening. They are using data-driven decisions as to which counties will open and, and which ones um, will not open yet. So um, we're going to be um, having very robust conversations with the state about a myriad of issues, um, obviously one including, you know, will we be one of those counties included? Could you give me a little more detail on that upcoming conversation later on today in terms of who is involved on the state end and then in terms of uh, throughout other legislators throughout the state? Is it mostly county executives um, and with whom would they be speaking? So we're having just our own calls right now. Um, this is not a group call with anyone, but it's important for us to, uh, you know, we will be, if they open up the north central and they open up the northwest, which is sort of the area that the state has talked about opening, we would be the largest county and we'd be the only county with a health department. And we know that we're doing things very differently and much more robustly here in Erie County. So we think we could be a very good partner with the state on how this is done, how it's done in the, mo in the safest way possible. And so those conversations are really more around that and that partnership and how we could be helpful, not only for our own county, but maybe for the whole region in terms of uh, just some of the things that we've done here that have been um, that have been done really well and are very successful, and so that's what, those are the kind of conversations we're having, and just also about information that we need, uh, even on some of these most recent openings. Like for example, we haven't gotten any guidance yet on campgrounds, and campgrounds are opening on Friday, so we need more guidance on some of these things. And um, again, through our health department and what we are calling our education or enforcement team. That's the team that's really been working in comp with our businesses to bring forward the compliance that's needed to keep everybody safe. Uh, I don't really know of any other county that's doing what we've been doing in the North Central and Northwest, but maybe there are others. Um, but we, we want to explain to them what we've been doing and how successful it's been. Um, because it's really been a true partnership with our businesses. So those are the kind of conversations we're having. And um, you know, as we have more information, we will get it out to businesses, we get it out on our website, and we'll get it out to the media um, as quickly as we can. Talk here. And one final, oh, just to uh, sure. um, tie a bow on that, if I may. Are you mm -hmm. talking with members of the governor's team or more of the Department of Health, just looking for which angle you'd be looking at today? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> uh, Department of Health, the governors, the Department of Community Economic Development, you know, the main, uh, and the main uh, departments that are involved in the work that we're doing here on the ground. Thanks. Sure. Uh-huh. Talk Erie. Yes, good afternoon. It's Joel, uh, Kathy. I wanted to refer to the more research survey that was just released this week mm -hmm. uh, and uh, circle back to this testing concept. Um, they asked, uh, there's over 2,000 uh, recipients and respondents. They asked about their status of health. 4% of the respondents had spoken with their doctor about their symptoms. So they were symptomatic, right? Only 1% had uh, were tested for COVID-19 and, uh, and and earlier in the survey it says two percent had all four symptoms that are the most prevalent for COVID-19. It goes back to this qu question that I keep on asking is the testing here in Erie County and maybe across the country so restrictive that physicians and primary care providers are not uh, allowing their patients to get tested even though they may have full-blown COVID? So, of course, um, the survey is done um, talking to people who may have had their symptoms. Oh, we've, we've been uh, six and a half weeks now since our first diagnosis here in Erie County. And we do know that in the beginning, particularly the first uh, few weeks, uh, testing was very restrictive. Um, for a myriad of reasons, one mostly being because we didn't have the test sites up and we didn't have enough test kits and we didn't even have enough swabs or reagent to do those tests. And I don't say we because the county doesn't do those tests. I want to make sure people understand that again, that those tests are being done through our hospitals, through a physician's office, and now uh, through some of our pharmacies. 
So uh, that testing uh, had to be restricted to the people who had full-blown out symptoms, I guess. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not the person making those decisions, and neither is my health care staff. Um, but we um, know that there were some restrictions early on, particularly. Now the cases are very different. Um, now you can go online, for example, Rite Aid, as we know, opened up a couple weeks ago, and you can go online and you can fill out a survey, and if you even have some one of those symptoms, you can go up there and you can get a test and you don't need your doctor to give you a order for that. So it has definitely changed. So um, the survey, and again, we don't know when the person who responded, when was this that they didn't go and get a test? We don't have that kind of detail. Uh, from the survey results that I saw. So you're, you're feeling more confident that the a number of tests is more reflective of the amount of contagion that's out in Erie County? Well, we don't really know that because, again, it's been six and a half weeks and there's been, um, it's been a gradual uh, loosening of the criteria around testing. So uh, I can't say that when I say this number of uh, you know, 87 today, does that reflect uh, the uh, number of people in this community who had COVID-19? I don't think it does. I think we all know that there was plenty, a uh, number of people who were positive and never got tested, um, who had symptoms and never got tested, and then people who were asymptomatic and of course never got tested. But uh, testing continues to be um, a limiting factor across the entire United States. It's not as much of a limiting factor in some other countries, but it is across the United States. And so we are living with what the reality is. And we could certainly use more testing. One of the things we're trying to do through the Department of Health is work with some of our other community partners. Um, we opened up a health equities branch within our command structure to work with those communities who we feel may have some inequities, and especially during when it comes to testing. Um, if you don't have a car, it sometimes it's hard to get to a place where you can get tested. Um, until recently, you had to have a doctor's order. We know we have a number of people who don't have a physician. Um, they may not have health insurance. There's a myriad of reasons why they would not go get tested. They may not even realize that they cannot and they will not be charged for that test. And so these are things we're trying to uh, help uh, reduce those barriers and get into uh, some of those populations who are more at risk. And uh, we see it as a win-win for everybody because if we can make sure that all populations have access to testing in an uh, equal amount, you know, that it's, there's equity across all people in our community, that will give us a better look at what the actual incidence is in our community. Uh, Jet TV. Yeah, hi, Kathy. So I want to circle back to something you mentioned. So since uh, you said many of these cases are uh, connected, are any of the cases stemming from things like Easter Sunday get-togethers, uh, the auction, or perhaps the protests that took place in downtown Erie? It seems like many of them are connected to group to gatherings of either family or friends, um, getting together for meals, getting together to celebrate, getting together to uh, just be together. And uh, that is really where we're seeing uh, quite a large um, spreading of the COVID-19 in our community right now. And so it is people knowing other people, gathering, people who don't live in the same home together, gathering for, um, for whatever purpose, but gathering. And that's really uh, much of that is, is contact to contact person. And, and that's really been a big part of what we've seen in the growing numbers that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Erie Times News. Hi, Kathy. Um, are you concerned at all that the percentage of cases among African American residents in Erie County is proportionally higher than the, I guess, the makeup of the, the, the demographic makeup of the county? It is a concern, and that's why we've been working hard to try to build out this health equities piece of our response. And I think um, we have a lot of good things that are happening there but it takes a little time to build all of that up. We also don't know, um, you know, when you look at the percentage of unknowns, and that percentage came because in the beginning, uh, those who were putting the test results into this statewide system didn't put race in. And we know that that's been a huge issue across the entire Commonwealth. Remember, those, those um, 
that data is not put in by the Erie County Department of Health. That data is put in by the whoever has gotten the information when the test was done. So uh, I think we have 13% 13 unknown. Are those people all Caucasian? Are they all African American? Are they all some other ethnicity that we don't know about? We don't know. So that's the other big unknown. So um, there are concerns. And that's why once we started to see those numbers, once they started to finally come through, we decided we needed to do something and try to find a way to open up testing in neighborhoods where people haven't had the best access to um, health care for a long time. And that's why we're doing um, that and so many other initiatives. It was mentioned a little bit yesterday about how we're talking about a door hanger that we can put on people's doors and even giving them masks so that they can have some of the things that they need to give them the, the correct information and then hopefully get the help they need if they need to be tested. Thank uh, you. Go ahead. Maddie? Oh, okay. Eerie I'm sorry, I just said thank you, Kevin. Okay, thanks. Erie Times News? I mean, I'm sorry, Erie News Now? I just wanted to follow up with uh, conversations with the state. Do you get the sense that they've already pretty well made up their minds as to which counties will be allowed to reopen, or is it more of a situation where you've got a couple of days to make Erie County's case and uh, uh, convince folks in Harrisburg that we're ready to go here? I don't think that we need to convince Harrisburg of anything right now. I think they're really looking at the data, and that's what's going to make their decisions as to whether a county opens or not. Um, and when you look at the data from Erie County, I think our data is such that we would be a county that would be um, highly considered to be uh, ready to open. Um, we all have concerns about what this is going to look like, and it's really going to depend on the people of our community and the businesses and how well they work along with us to keep our numbers low, um, what this looks like after hopefully we are open. So I don't think the state, I think the state is figuring it out. And um, there's a lot to do around that. My concern is really much more if we are on that list, which I think we probably will be, um, where's the guidance to help us figure out what this looks like? You know, we need the guidance. We need it sooner rather than later. We need to know what to tell our businesses. Our businesses need to know because it's going to take some businesses more than a week to get everything in place that they need to have in place to open up. And so we want to be there for them and to give them the guidance, but we need to first get that guidance from the state. So that's really the bigger piece for me. Tom? And uh, is that a little frustrating that we learned about almost two weeks ago now about uh, this, this tentative plan to maybe start reopening things on May 8th? And um, here we are nine days out and still no real guidance from, uh, from state leaders. This is hard. It's hard work for everybody. I mean, this is we are in a situation that no one's ever been in before. No state level, no county level, um, no federal level, really. 1918, Spanish influenza, anybody who's still alive from that was a child, a baby probably when that occurred. So um, even though you plan for these things, I think this pandemic took many of us, um, I don't want to say by surprise, but certainly the, the extent of it by surprise. Uh, there have been public health officials who've been talking for years about the fact that we've got to put more money into being prepared. We weren't prepared. And so the state is scrambling like we all are scrambling. The federal government's scrambling. And I think we're doing a better job. I don't see, think we're scrambling as much as we did. And now we're doing things in, in much more, um, with much more data to, to back us up. But um, I, I don't know that I want to put fault on anyone. But I'm just, again, pleading to the state that we need to be your partner, use the resources that are out here, and we'll get resources, hopefully, from you, because I think that the local governments have a lot to offer to the state that sometimes we aren't called upon to bring our expertise forward. So that's what my uh, goal is, is to help the state understand that um, counties like ours, counties who have the bandwidth that we do, could actually really help the state to be more prepared and to help those other counties, particularly who don't have a health department, uh, do the right thing when they open. Talk Erie. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, wanted to ask about long-term care facilities. Uh, 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 Secretary Levine has been saying over and over in her press conferences that, uh, you know, even though uh, an entire county might be doing okay, if they have a, a long-term care facility with many cases, it's going to downgrade their, you know, coding, if you will, to go from red to yellow. I, I know that you've said that you don't have uh, 
generally a voice in how uh, long-term care facilities are doing their jobs. But since so much of, of our status would be dependent on them staying safe and COVID free, do you have uh, any kind of communication loop with the long-term care facilities? Well, that's a great question um, because what we decided is we needed to have that. And so now we have taken one of our team members from our COVID response team and he is his job now is to be that direct connection to all of those long-term care facilities. And uh, we hope that with that kind of uh, communication and having that dialogue back and forth that we can stay on top of this. I had a great conversation just uh, earlier this week with the county executive from Erie County, New York, and he said, don't let this thing get away from you on the nursing home side, because it happened in Erie County, New York, and it's been devastating. Uh, the, many, many of their deaths have happened within those facilities. We have been very fortunate that our facilities have been able to do what's needed to keep COVID-19 out of the vast majority of facilities and even those who had a case have been limited to basically one case and, cont and contained very quickly. So yes, so we started um, uh, to have that kind of dialogue and conversation with our long-term care facilities and I think that will just grow and become more robust, particularly as we go into this um, more uh, open yellow phase of uh, the response. Thanks. Uh -huh. uh, Jet TV, do you have any last questions? Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about businesses. So we've been receiving uh, quite a few calls. Businesses are still unsure who they should contact uh, if they'd like to submit a business plan, I guess, uh, if, to the health department regarding reopening starting on May 8th if we are granted into that yellow phase. So we're working. So can you provide some light on that? Yeah, sure. We're working with the chamber. Uh, they have their restart program, and uh, we've talked to them about having maybe a business hotline that they could field a lot of these questions initially and then if there was things that couldn't be answered then you know the county health department um, the inspector division could come in and and help them um, answer anything that they can't so we're working with them directly and i hope to have something to report to you out here very shortly in the meantime you know they can always call 451-6700 or certainly go on our website there's a lot of guidance on there already and as we get anything from the state you know, uh, we put it up there. Today we put that golf information up there. It didn't come from the state. It came from the PA Association of Golfing, I believe is who I said. Um, and that information is now on our website. So that's a help. I've also had conversations with um, uh, entities in Erie County uh, who I've asked them if they could collectively Let's just take the funeral homes, for example. Could they collectively, because they have a great association, come together with a plan? Um, one plan, all the funeral homes agree to it, then that's one plan to look at rather than the multitude of plans we'd have to look at for every nursing home, or for every uh, funeral home. The same thing in the tourism industry. Um, Visit Erie's been helpful, and they're looking at different sectors, and could they bring forward a plan by sector. And so I would ask any business out there, if you're in a sector with other businesses like you, could you come together and, and collectively, do you have an association who can collectively put together a plan? And then um, we'll be working, as I said, with the chamber and really with any of our economic development entities uh, through the health department, we'll work as we have to be a partner in this. But we're still waiting, unfortunately, for a lot of guidance from the state but I still think the guidance that we had for our life-sustaining businesses, which is on our website, is great guidance to start with. If nothing else, it gives you some great ideas on how you could be compliant with things. Okay, um, Erie Times News, do you have any last questions? Um, yeah, just to piggyback off of that, do you, if Erie County is able to enter the yellow phase on May 8th, are you hearing from employers and employees that they feel that they have adequate protections in terms of actual physical stuff like masks and disinfectant to keep their employees safe? Um, I think it varies. I think some feel that they are ready and they have what they need and others feel that they still are struggling to find that protective equipment and protective products that we talk about. Um, I know the chamber's also looking at maybe doing a business to business piece on their website where um, some businesses in Erie who are making masks could be tied into businesses who need masks, for example. And those 
may very simply be the cloth mask, and that's really what most people just need is something to cover their face. Um, so you don't need to go out and get the N95. As in fact, we suggest you don't get those. We need to save those for healthcare personnel and, and people on the front lines. So um, the, again, through the Chamber's website and through other entities, we're trying to connect those two together. Um, and with the disinfectant, I know some of our distilleries have gotten into creating disinfectant to help everyone out. Um, and so I know businesses who have gone and got a five gallon um, container of disinfectant from one of our distilleries and then they put it into smaller bottles and, and you know, have it where their employees could uh, access it. So that's really great. It's really great to see us trying to help each other and utilize our local businesses to find the things that we need. But I do think it varies whether businesses are ready or not. And that's why the more advanced notice we have for our businesses, the better. But I just keep telling businesses, prepare, prepare, prepare. Do what you need to do to prepare. And uh, we hopefully we can get you back open. Thank Erie, you. Mm -hmm. Erie News Now, do you have any more questions? Yes, please, if I may. One final one. Uh, in terms of if we're able to reopen uh, a little bit on May 8th, what does that look like from a county perspective in terms of preparedness? I know you've got enforcement teams out and about already um, responding to a lot of calls. If we see this gradual lifting of restrictions, would you be looking at a situation where you might need to create more of those teams uh, just to be sure that, that people are staying in compliance and, and doing what you can to keep people safe? Um, you know, so not even from a business perspective, but from an enforcement and safety perspective, are we ready to go yet? So we are looking at increasing our numbers in these areas, um, both on our enforcement compliance side and in our contact tracing side. And, and what does that look like? And so those are plans that are in the works right now. Um, you know, there was an estimate put out uh, from a national news story that you need, I'm sorry, 30 um, contact tracers per 100,000. So, you know, about 275 thousand people here in Erie. So I'm just going to do some quick math and say that's about uh, 80 we would need. We don't have anywhere near 80. So, um, but we do know there are ways to train these people up and get them um, out there and helping us do that. Um, on the compliance side, we also have to think about the fact that we do need to get some of these people back to the work that they do every day. Uh, restaurant inspections, uh, septic, we, they, they check septic systems with campgrounds opening. Um, we have inspections that have to happen at those places. So that's also a big concern of ours as the businesses open. Um, we got to get people back to like the normal work they do and yet we have this other work on top of that. So yeah, these are concerns we have as county government and the Department of Health in, in particular and how do we continue to do the great work we've been doing knowing that we have additional work on top of that. Uh, in the summertime, our food inspectors are very, very busy uh, with all the fairs and the festivals and all of those kind of things. Uh, if those don't happen, or very few of them happen, of course, that does loosen that up a bit, but um, there still is a lot of work that needs to be done um, coming up, and so it's a concern. It is definitely a concern, and uh, we are looking at how we handle that. But. I know that uh, my employees and my staff are up to the challenge of being creative and figuring out how we do this. And, and that's what we do, and that's what they do every day. Can you give me just a ballpark on how many contact tracers we have right now? I knew you were going to ask me that when I said that question, and I'm trying to remember how many <laughs> there are there. And I don't have that answer on the top of my head, but um, I want to say maybe it's about 20, 25 maybe that totally work on this. Um, that's the whole piece of it, you know. There's some that do the initial work, that do the initial interview with the person who's positive. That's the key one that, that takes uh, a lot of time. It takes a huge skill set to help someone really figure out everything that they did and where they went and all of those type of things. And, uh, and I mean, to be honest, sometimes days later, something occurs in a conversation and we find out that something new about this person and, and maybe some new context. So it's an ongoing thing. And then we have other people who are doing more of the data entry and, and the follow-up and that's not as intensive. And so that maybe doesn't take quite the skill set that the first person um, does, but it's also about trust. And these people build up a lot of trust with the people that they are in contact with. And um, that's important uh, to get a good interview and to get the right information, you got to be able to build up that trust. So um, I hope I'm not too far off on those numbers, but I can confirm that tomorrow with you. 
appreciate it. Thanks so sure. much. Sure. Talk Erie. Uh, do you have any final questions? Just one last reaction to the more research survey. Uh, at the top of their survey, they're talking about how concerned are you about the coronavirus impact on your household? It's well above two thirds that are that are somewhat to extremely concerned. Uh, this this virus is impacting pretty much nearly every household in Erie County. Just share some words of uh, of your reaction to that. I think every single one of us has been affected. There's not a person um, hardly in the globe who hasn't been affected by this um, COVID-19. Uh, here in Erie County, those numbers did not surprise me at all because I know talking to people, seeing, seeing even people's reactions when you walk by them in the street, uh, people are concerned. People want to do the right thing. Um, we still have some people who don't believe this is any big deal. Um, it's comparable to, for example, the flu. Uh, this is different than the flu. Uh, I can decide to get a flu vaccine if I want, and I can take uh, that proactive approach. I can't do anything to help protect me against COVID-19. Um, we also know that this is a virus that has many side effects that are unknown and things that are happening that are new and different and unique. And so uh, the flu, we pretty much know um, what the symptoms tend to be and, and that it's seasonal. And so there's a rhythm, I guess, to the flu that we know every year. The death rate uh, over the short amount of time of COVID-19 has been much higher than it is for the flu on an annual basis. So, so, there's, so this is different, and this is why um, you know, it's the unknown. You can't see a virus, right? You can see um, a car coming towards you, and you can step out of the way. You don't see that virus coming towards you. And this is reasons why people are concerned. But I do want to tell people out there that we have the best people working on this locally. And I know that there are great people working on this nationally and internationally. And so um, you can take comfort in that. And I think everyone should take comfort in the fact that we can all protect ourselves. So I'm gonna go back to the things I always say. This is how you protect yourself. You wash your hands frequently for at least 20 seconds. You use hand sanitizer when you don't have the ability to wash your hands. You clean the surfaces that you normally touch and other people might touch frequently. You also keep yourself six foot away from any other person that doesn't live in your home. And you always wear a mask when you're out and about and near any other people. And a mask protects them. And I hope that you tell them you would like them to be wearing a mask because their mask protects you. So for those who have concerns and fear, um, if we all do those three fairly simple but important things, um, then I think we can all know that we will be safer until there is a day when we have a vaccine that we can take to prevent COVID-19 and we also have better treatments for how this disease is treated and keep people healthier. Thanks. And with that, I think I've said everything I need to say today and I appreciate again, um, everyone's partnership on this from the people who are listening to the people who uh, run these different media outlets who've been great partners of us, to our healthcare providers who are working every day to keep all of us safe. So in the meantime, if you can, please stay home, please stay safe, and please stay calm.